This is Marketing Jam, a show featuring the brightest minds in marketing. I want to welcome everyone to the next episode of Marketing Jam. I am very excited. Ken Steele is here from Education. Uh, we're going to find out what that means, and we're going to find out about Ken. So thank you so much for joining us uh, this week. Ken, thank you for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Uh, why don't we jump in? What, what does Eduvation mean, the name of your company? Thanks for having me, Darian. Uh, Eduvation is uh, focused on tracking trends and innovations and bright ideas promising things that are transforming the world of higher education specifically. So I work a lot with colleges and universities on uh, everything from their branding and positioning to their strategic planning, looking at the context around them, which has been changing rapidly for decades, but now in the last few months has started changing even more. Uh, looking at innovations in marketing and in recruitment, in uh, support services and, and sort of ways to help students complete, but also innovations in the ways you'd expect around delivery of education, online, VR, uh, and a whole range of other things. So there's a lot of fascinating things happening uh, to transform the way we teach. And, uh, and I think uh, I'm interested in most of it. That's amazing. So uh, a lot of folks we've had on the show, we talk about, you know, marketing coffee to chocolate bars to which uh, meal delivery service do you use? Um, how is education marketed differently than that? Like, why are you marketing education? Well, I think the world we're living in is one in which uh, institutions are competing more and more aggressively with each other for enrollment. So as the governments have shifted over the last 10 years or so from models where they fund the institution based on a historical funding envelope. I won't get too technical, but they, they've traditionally funded the institutions on a, on a flat rate basis and that, and they've moved to funding them on enrollments and making sure they hit their enrollment corridors. Uh, and now increasingly they're funding them based on the student completion rates, their employment rates, their starting salaries. So, so more and more institutions are fixating on, on improving their competitiveness in recruiting students. And for many institutions, they have to recruit students from further afield. So they've got to recruit, they've got to recruit students from uh, the south if they're a northern institution. They've got to recruit them from Ontario if they're an east coast institution. Uh, and more and more institutions in Canada have been dependent on international students. Uh, so you've got to build a brand that stands out among tens of thousands of other brands around the world. So, so more and more the discipline of marketing has been coming to bear on higher ed. And you see more and more folks coming out of the agency world or out of packaged or consumer goods uh, to work in higher ed marketing departments. And how did you make that switch? How did you go and choose this of all the, the, the industries to go into? Well, I didn't choose it for the money. <laughs> I'll tell you that, Darren. But I, I, my own background is is eccentric, uh, make, like many people in marketing. I started out uh, in English Lit. I was doing a PhD in Shakespeare at the University of Toronto. I spent far too long of my youth uh, focused on becoming an academic. Uh, when I finally decided this wasn't really for me, uh, like most English majors, you fall back on writing. Uh, I had a bit of a passion as well for design and marketing felt like a really natural fit. Um, but, but ultimately the the clients that resonated most with me were those clients who were in the educational space so whether that was uh consulting on crisis communications for a school board or it was working with a university or a college or even a private college on their branding and marketing materials uh it was about 15 or 20 years ago that i decided to focus on that one vertical in marketing so so looking at higher education in particular uh and ultimately market research was the starting point uh so so analysis and strategy in particular Wow. So those that are uh, maybe new to the world or, or maybe in a different world of marketing, how do you market a college different than a university or, or how do you treat them differently? There's certainly differences between marketing a, an educational institution, which in Canada lar largely means you're working at a, 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 a public institution, a college or university. Uh, and, and so the tone you take and the way you approach it is certainly different. Their budgets are far smaller than you'd see in you know, any number of other sectors, whether it's beer or t tobacco or any of the sins. Uh, education has, um, coming back to your question, um, 
colleges and universities vary across around the world. I mean, you use the word college in the U.S., you can mean it's just about anything. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in Canada, when we talk about a college, we're typically talking about a community college that has two-year uh, diplomas. It might have a three-year advanced diploma or an applied degree. Uh, universities, on the other hand, have four-year undergraduate degrees. They have master's or graduate studies, PhDs in some cases. Uh, and so, so there's a distinction between those universities that are purely theoretical education in a way and call I'm really simplifying because I yeah. want to bring it together. Universities that are purely theoretical, colleges that are purely applied. And what we've yeah. seen over the last 20 years is they're they're moving closer and closer together. So so okay. colleges are are offering more and more degree programs and collaborating with universities. Universities are offering more and more uh, professional and uh, career oriented programming with work integrated learning opportunities and so on. But but in general, universities have researchers on campus so they can position themselves around research. They can position themselves around university ranking numbers globally or nationally. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, colleges don't do that. Colleges tend to focus on uh, their support services, the career-focused nature of their programs, the the co-op placements, and the ways in which their students get a head start, and so on. Uh, so certainly, the content of messaging is distinct, but in a lot of ways, they're looking at the same target segments. They're looking yeah. at students straight out of high school. They're looking at older folks who are changing career paths, and. Uh, and a lot of what they're selling is, is the same thing, whether it's, you know, uh, career advancement or it, or it's uh, personal development. Uh, but they but they do come they come from slightly different positions and they emphasize different aspects of what they offer. So, Ken, you're in a really unique position is that you basically have a finger on the pulse of what a lot of universities and colleges are doing. I, I get your e-newsletter now. It's, it's incredible. Oh. If you aren't subscribed yet and you have any. Uh, involvement in higher education marketing and, and work. Make sure you subscribe uh, to Ken's e-newsletter. It's inspiring. It's chock full of really good uh, summaries of what's happening right across the country. Uh, so what's maybe something, a, a trend you're seeing that, that maybe right across the board amongst universities and colleges when it comes to marketing? There, there are dozens of things that are that are changing. One of the things, you know, thinking about your audience as broader than just higher education marketers, I think in a lot of ways, higher ed is catching up with other sectors, okay. uh, starting to apply technologies. They're starting to apply more strategy. They're doing geotargeting, retargeting, things that were unknown a few years back. Uh, th there's there's more and more of that. I think in general, what what higher ed's been doing has been fixating more and more on personal one on one interactions. In effect, what marketers might describe as the worlds of marketing and sales are becoming better integrated. So. Mm -hmm. So the recruitment or liaison officers who go out and talk to prospective students or even advisors um, are getting connected in and they're integrating social media efforts, uh, CRMs that power customized web pages, mm -hmm. uh, th those kinds of things that are that are creating a much more one on one conversation, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is a transformation that marketing in general has been dealing with is, is this sort of move from unidirectional pushing mm -hmm. out our messages to a conversation, a bi-directional approach to marketing. I think I think we certainly see higher ed doing more and more of that. Um, right. You know, there, there's there's other things too. I, I think there's a there's a growing awareness that the current students on campus, the alumni, the prospective students are this community that uh, I think institutions are starting to build more of a sort of tribal brand. They're they're recognizing that that these people can help to create the brand. User generated content uh, mm -hmm. contributes to it. Success stories and so on. So there's there's much more interest in uh, instead of sort of a bankerly corporate mm -hmm. position. Institutions mm -hmm. are trying to create a a sense of sort of communally who are we and and yeah. getting. Leveraging those, you know, they, they may have a very small marketing department. A lot of big colleges will only have a couple of people working in marketing, but yeah. but they have tens of thousands of people on their campuses who are active yeah. on social media, who have podcasts, yeah. who do channels. And so trying to um, enable that and and shape some of the messaging that faculty members might be sharing, that that students might be sharing uh, is, is certainly a big part of what's been changing in the last while. Do you have a story of a, of a, maybe a college or university that has done something really cool or really innovative that you uh, want listeners to hear about? Hmm. 
I know well, you they, can't play favorites. I know well, you can't highlight I, one of you. I, I don't play favorites, but I certainly there are some standout examples of interesting approaches. I mean, a few years ago, Memorial University in Newfoundland did a, a fascinating reality TV approach to positioning, mar uh, to basically communicating to prospective students. So they had a, a group of students, I think there were about a dozen first year students and a student director and videographer. And they basically did a sequence of 10 or 20 episodes through the year that tracked those 10 yeah. students oh. through first year at the university. That's so smart. You know, they had mental health breakdowns and they had, it was the good, the bad, the ugly was shared yeah. there. It was a lot of work. And I think it didn't, uh, it may have recurred for the second year, but I don't think oh, yeah. they were able to keep it going because the people involved graduated. Yeah. And, yeah. But, but it, it, I think that was a pretty neat example of, of what you could do in that direction. Yeah. Um, that really, what I, about postage and, and mailing? Are people still, are you finding that still relevant for yeah. higher ed? Oh yeah. Well, it's, higher education is probably the most conservative sector we've got next to say the Catholic church. The, right. <laughs> a thousand years, academe hasn't changed all that much. Mm -hmm. uh, COVID-19 is suddenly making it change a whole lot this year. But but in general terms, it's a very conservative sector. And uh, prospective students and their parents are looking for a lot of very conservative, reassuring, traditional pieces because they're buying an abstract intangible and they're trying to pin their child's future on this yeah. thing. Oh, so, yeah. So you see the importance of ivy covered walls. You see the importance of campus tours, mm -hmm. which is why this year is being so challenging on the recruiter yeah. side. Uh, and and likewise, you see a lot of print pieces that end up being produced still, even though websites are the number one source of information that everybody's using. Uh, the reality is you need something. It's like selling a luxury car. You need yeah. a brochure to send home with the yeah. customer just to let them sit on it what's that called uh when when you're trying to overcome their own doubts in the conversion process yeah. they haven't quite you know until they arrive on campus you need to yeah. keep reassuring them they're making a good choice and that yeah. and that sort of glossy view book is a, is a key piece to that but yeah. they've gotten smaller they used to yeah. be phone book size yeah. full of all kinds of dense type and now they're focused on photography and yeah. narrative and and storytelling and and they point to the website for all kinds of detail that no one really needs in a printed form anymore right so so print is is diminishing but it's still important and and in Canada we do less we do less direct mail in Canada than they do in the U.S. because in the U.S. colleges can buy mailing lists from the high schools. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in Canada, we have too much privacy for that. Yeah. So, so we don't do direct mail very often, but, uh, but the print piece that's given out at an information night or a fair or that's mailed on request remains important. So postage, probably a lot less than once. You know, yeah. alumni magazines have... have become fewer and far between they, they yeah. they're down to three one time as a year um less postage than ever i guess sorry canada post but 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 uh it's it remains important and i and yeah. i think uh you know we we're still a couple of generations away from from getting completely rid of that persuasive impact of tangible paper uh the the conversion package i guess one good example is after a student's applied to post-secondary, more and more energy is going into what they call conversion, where you're you're trying to ensure they accept your offer. So institutions are sending more and more elaborate packages. I think this year we're going to see a big boost in swag being sent to applicants. So they're going to get T-shirts, they're going to get mugs, they're going to get um, some schools like Brock University a few years back did packets of confetti that students oh, could cool. throw in the air and do a little video to celebrate yeah. their being accepted. Uh, wow. You know, that kind of stuff uh, is probably where mailing gets used most, I guess, in the, in the, in the marketing side is, is in that conversion process for an applicant. So Ken, outside of uh, your e-newsletter, where can people go uh, for sources of information, inspiration, ideas like books, magazines? Where do you go? that keeps you kind of fired up and, and on the edge of, what, that's a, of what's happening. Yeah, that, that is a tricky question. I mean, a, a lot, I, I spend three hours every morning just absorbing 
things. I, I subscribe to 800 YouTube feeds from colleges and universities wow. around. Oh, yeah. I watch everything, but I watch for the interesting things. I, I read journals in the higher ed space and in the marketing yeah. space. I mean, all, a lot of the obvious things. Uh, I think, you know, when I think about it, there are, there are a few. Let me just remember now I had some notes on this. Oh, it's the page I didn't pull out. Here we go. I printed it on paper. Uh, the, the, there are a few um, books, I guess. I mean, I, I, I tend to be a pretty conventional media consumer in the sense that I still read the Globe and Mail on my iPad in its traditional print format. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I watch TV news, although it tends to be on YouTube in little snippets instead of having to watch the whole newscast. Um, but there are some books that I think are are particularly powerful that come right to mind. There was one book that really helped me in the early days by Marcia Sinatar called Do What You Love and the Money Will Follow mm -hmm. that that was it was recommended to me by my career advisor at the University of Toronto as I was debating whether a PhD is really what I wanted. Uh, and and I think as we all look to reinvent ourselves right now, it's it's still a powerful message about sort of you know, what is what what are your core strengths? What do you most enjoy doing? I think one of the key questions she asks in that book is what would you do if you weren't if you didn't get paid for it? What would you do anyway? Mm -hmm. That points you to some of the things that you're most driven and passionate about. I also, like so many people, I suspect, like Jim Collins, Good to Great, I think mm -hmm. uh, as a as a business strategy book, it it has some very powerful messages about focusing on your knitting about being in it for the long haul uh the hedgehog concept and the flywheel concept and so on um and and then finally i've been giving i'm going to go back and reread timothy ferris's book the four hour work week uh because it's all about sort of inventing uh inventing your own your own career your own business mm -hmm. in such a way uh, that it that it has momentum on its own. And I think as we start to look at, you know, what do we do with this uh, sudden bout of home-based working, of uh, online business and e-commerce, you know, what what uh, what what could happen? So I think if I if I reread a couple of those books together, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it'll be an interesting uh, an interesting way to treat our our quarantine yeah. uh, during this this great pandemic of 2020. Yeah. Yeah. So um, universities and colleges that are interested in kind of maybe pushing the envelope or doing something new or trying some new things, what's, what's your advice to them? Want to kind of shake it up a bit. Colleges from their founding in the 60s have a mandate to serve the local labor market needs uh, of their region. So they are fixated on employers. They're monitoring employers. They have committees of employers that help them design the programs to graduate students to fit the needs of the labor market. Universities have a much older model that's formed around a sort of a, a community of scholars who have come together rather like monks in a monastery mm -hmm. in the Middle Ages. Uh, and a lot of what's done there is done because it, um, it it's what faculty want. It supports their research. It supports mm -hmm. the, 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 the renewal of the faculty by graduating grad students. Uh, but actually listening to your market is a radical idea for most universities. Uh, and and I think schools like Royal Roads in BC have done a really good job of constructing curriculum programs and delivery based on understanding who their market is. You you mm -hmm. talk to mid-career professionals who want to hold down a job while advancing their, their education, and then you design the whole institution around that. Nobody else really with a couple of exceptions. Nobody else in the country has done that for an educational institution. But listening to your market is one of those fundamental pieces of advice. Understanding what your perceived per position is in that market compared to a bunch of other options that students have. Um, and, and sort of focusing that brand messaging. Those are some pretty basic things for anyone else in marketing. But in higher ed, those are fighting words in many cases. Wow. <laughs> It, it creates all kinds of internal turmoil to start talking about an institution that way. Mm. Wow. Now, Ken, uh, are you an iOS or an Android guy? Uh, I have been an Apple guy for a long time. Uh, I've 
lost a little of my fervor for the brand under under uh, Tim Cook's leadership. I think Apple has turned into an innovator in finance, not an innovator mm-hmm. in technology. And so Apple Pay, Apple Music, all these subscription yeah. services. I mean, they're very innovative on generating revenue from us. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I'm an Apple guy. What was and the apps, apps that you can't live without each day. What are your go-tos? Oh, my gosh. Well, there's so many. Uh, I, I use Feedly across multiple platforms to track RSS feeds. I, um, I certainly use YouTube's apps everywhere. Uh, I use Evernote, uh, to organize way too much, uh, information that I want to track and come back to later. Um, what opens automatically on my computers, uh, obviously email, uh, that's kind of dull, but, um, I'm a big fan of Evernote, a big fan of uh, cloud-based services. I've been, for the last 12 years, I've been trying to construct as lean an organization as possible by putting everything into the cloud I can. Mm. Uh, so so whether that's Dropbox or it's or it's Zoom or it's Evernote, um, trying to, to, using accounting software like FreshBooks to sort of move everything up uh, into the cloud, keep it available from any device. Uh, those have all been uh, valuable. So what's what's your advice if someone's thinking of going into post-secondary marketing, whether it's working for a college or university or starting to serve that vertical, what do you recommend? Do you think now's the right time or what, what's some of the things to like look out for, the pitfalls and, and the joys of it, maybe, would I'd say. Or some call it the rose and the thorn. <laughs> well, I think there's certainly going to be some interest. I've... I've um... I've written for for college and university leadership that that this is a buyer's market now for talent. If any of you have any budgets left, that's one of the challenges that that with the the inevitable drop in international enrollments, the institutions are going to be lean. They may well be laying off or furloughing faculty and staff over the next year. Uh, it will come back. The question is whether it comes back before others. So so uh, it's frequently tough for public sector organizations to to afford great talent. This may be an opportunity as various sectors suffer setbacks. There may be a lot of new marketing talent out there looking for work. And and public sector public sector institutions like colleges and universities are pretty reliable employers. They have good benefits. They have pensions in many cases. I mean, they're, they're a good place to work. Uh, I think the critical thing I've seen go wrong is when uh, commercial marketers enter into the academic space without realizing what they're getting into, that mm-hmm. this is not a world where the CEO can dictate anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's more like parliament, the the prime minister of a minority government and and the president of a university have the same kind of challenges. They have to they have to motivate people, bring them along, build consensus, but they can't dictate anything. So so marketers who step in and start thinking that they can determine what's the product, what's the offering and how are we going to price it? You know, none of that works anymore. So so recognize I think the more you know about how higher ed institutions work politically, the safer it'll be, uh, because there's a lot of things that they will really find difficult to tolerate. The mm. best best case scenarios are rally lots of data, which is mm. you know, partly my background in market research is, mm. you know, if you've got data, that helps yeah. to reassure the, the, the science types on campus, the social science types on campus. Uh, and, and it always really helps to have comparators. So if you can say, hey, Harvard's doing this, mm. all the objections go away. <laughs> mm. Or UBC's doing this. Or the, the more examples you can show people, which is why I think, you know, that, that, that landscape scanning I'm doing is helpful for people because you can say, well, here's five other schools that have tried this. And so, you know, what's holding us back? Um, mm. Like right now, we've got more than half, I think we got about a third of the institutions in the country have launched pass fail grading as a one time solution for this term because so many students have been disrupted by the pandemic. It's it's interesting to watch it move across the country, but it starts with schools like McGill who are confident enough that they can do it. And it's gradually working its way down to institutions that are worried about whether their students transcripts will uh, allow them to go on to study at McGill. Uh, so, So we're gradually seeing institutions 
coming along because there's a, a momentum, there's a there's a consensus among in other institutions. So, so certainly those are two things that you can do to help smooth the political waters as a marketer in hiring. Now, what's a college to be watching right now that's doing some really, really cool stuff that you, maybe you admire, you, uh, you're kind of keeping a pulse on? Well, there, there are so many institutions doing interesting things in the marketing space. Uh, it'll be interesting to see just what happens next in some okay. way. Yeah. It, I, I think uh, a lot of these are not long lived. So, mm. so you see every, every time a presidential, uh, every time a president uh, transitions at an institution, mm. you get a turnover of leadership, you mm. get different attitudes towards marketing in particular they start restructuring and things start to change so so some institutions have been really good at this uh for a long time i i i think simon fraser university is a good example mm. of an institution under andrew patter's leadership which has been for some time now uh there's been a a, a growing focus on their position as Canada's engaged university, mm -hmm. this idea that they need to be engaged with the community, the, 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 the sort of reinforcement of engagement mm -hmm. on multiple levels. Uh, that, I think, is a good example of a, of a brand that's more than just a marketing department initiative. It, it becomes part of the strategic plan. It, it informs the research plan. It becomes part of what the institution's about. That's really uh, cool. There, let's see, I mean, there's so many schools doing neat things. I think uh, there's been some interesting campaign work. Often the really good campaigns are the result of an institution partnering with a good agency and mm -hmm. create some interesting stuff. So, mm -hmm. so uh, Nova Scotia, I want to make absolutely sure, Nova Scotia Community College uh, has been doing a, a campaign built on the word strive that oh. all about sort of their students overcoming adversity and and you know moving forward in their lives and trying to change the world and make it a better place. it's it's a it's a it's a nicely done campaign and uh it i, I think it's uh, a combination of an institution that's open to to some strong creative which doesn't always happen yeah uh, and it has the resources to partner with an agency that's willing to put some energy into it um, which again doesn't often happen. A lot of in in good economic times, colleges and universities are small clients for big agencies. Uh, whereas I think you know, whenever the economy suffers a setback, the universities start to get more um, more creative work out of agencies mm -hmm. because even though their budgets are small, they're 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 more significant in the context. So so it'll be interesting to see what happens next. I think we're going to see. Uh, we're going to see some interesting moves once we get past the initial shock of cutting budgets. And, and yeah. we'll see, you know, every organization looks at professional development, travel budgets and, and marketing budgets as soft places they could cut if they had to. It's not the right attitude at all, <laughs> but, but some institutions will do that and and the ones that don't will be the ones that get well positioned through this uh, i think it's inevitably that this is a recession <laughs> the ones that are going to be best positioned are the ones that are going to keep investing in building their brands oh, this is great can um where can people find you online how do they get connected to the work you do and and, and what you're up to so my website's at eduvation.ca education with a v uh and uh and i have a webcast called 10 with ken that comes out intermittently and mm -hmm. the goal was a 10 minute thing once a week it's it's yeah. more like 20 minutes and it's been a couple of months since the last yeah. one yeah. <laughs> but uh 10 with ken uh 10 with ken.com or education.ca are both places they can find my work ken it was a real pleasure to have you on the show so many great ideas such good advice I think a lot of folks are just learning about this uh, vertical, and so it's been really, really helpful. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. It's a yeah. pleasure to speak with you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us on Marketing Jam, and we'll see you next week on The Jam. Yeah.